felt like every part of my body was being ripped apart. I could hear myself screaming, no, I don't want to die, I don't want to die. At that point, that's when I realized I'm dead. And then I was back in my body, back in all that misery. Probably, you know, close to six foot tall, uh, 100 pounds, uh, long, skinny legs, long, thin arms, and uh, probably look a little Pee Wee Hermanish, <laughs> almost oh, absolutely a loner, you know, just completely different than anybody else. David is an only child. We were excited when when we had him, and he was a very big part of, of our of our lives. We did a lot of things together probably overindulged in him, um, as parents often do. The, the feeling of, of diving was, was freeing. The more I dove, the more comfortable I got, the more I felt like that I was part of the ocean. We hired a captain, his name was Jerry Beaudry, and we, David was a senior in high school now and decided that this would be his profession. He was my deckhand, uh, my first mate for a long time. We kind of hit it off right away, even though he was considerably younger than me at the time. It's wintertime and the water's cold and we gotta wear a full suit. And uh, I'm trying to get my full suit on and I'm struggling with it, struggling with it. I wasn't feeling well that day. I, I had uh, drank a little bit the night before and I kind of felt a little hungover. I'm getting that, that feeling like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw up. And I'm, you know, now I'm getting hot and sweaty and clammy and, but the thought comes in my mind, as soon as I get in the water, it's gonna be, it's gonna be all right. So I get my stuff on, but I don't get it on quite right. And I just bought a new hood to wear and the hood really didn't fit very well. I just shove it on and I get my mask over it and I get in the water and kind of bobbing in the water and I'm, ooh, I'm, I'm really feeling bad. And so I uh, put the regulator in my mouth and let the air out and I start going down. We're diving the kelp beds. It's a, it's a dangerous place to dive as well as a beautiful place to dive. I noticed that there must have been an air bubble in my hood or whatever, because it was pulling up on my chin and it was pulling my head up. And next thing I know, my, my hood kind of got turned and my mask got shoved off. And next thing I know, my mask is gone. And I started to get a little bit anxious or, or a little bit worried about what was going on. About that time, Josh had come over and was trying to help me with it. And in that process, I lost my regulator, my breathing device, and I panicked. I remember Josh, I think he was trying to put a regulator in my mouth, and I started fighting with him. Everything that I'd ever learned about scuba diving was out the window. I think Josh had realized that, that his life might have been in danger at this point, and he backed away. And time stopped. When I was 18, I married my childhood sweetheart and promptly produced three beautiful children. We had everything imaginable. We had an airplane, a swimming pool, fancy vacations, everything, everything that you needed to have in order to have the American dream. fallen in an accident and it felt like I had a whiplash in my lower spine. 
The pain that I had was debilitating, and I would be taking more and more pain pills trying to get it to stop. I wasn't a mother to my children anymore. I wasn't a wife to my husband. I was just this poor, pathetic person on a lot of drugs. It was my only hope to be able to function without drugs again. I woke up in a striker frame circle bed, which is an awesome way to survive from surgery. It looked like a Ferris wheel for one. There were two big chrome hoops and a stretcher suspended in the middle with me on it. Three times a day, two nurses would come in and then rotate me straight up and then over onto my face. And they would air out my back for 20 minutes so I wouldn't get pressure sores. Three days after surgery, a respiratory therapist came in and told me that they were concerned about uh, my breathing, that my breathing was becoming very shallow. And so he was gonna hook me up to this machine and it would breathe for me. He put this thing in my mouth that was between my gums and my lips so I couldn't remove it. Air would flow in and I could feel it expanding my lungs and then it would stop when my lungs were expanded and flow back out again. And he watched about three or four breaths and then he kind of signaled me that he was gonna go out for a few minutes and he'd be back before the treatment was over. And he left. And I just was lying there feeling it moving in and moving out, moving in and moving out. And then all of a sudden, it just kept going and going and going. And it was as though somebody had stuck a hose in my mouth and turned on water and I was drowning. There was no way I could catch my breath. It was just expanding me. It's it, like my lungs were gonna explode and it was so terrifying. I became so scared that I lost consciousness. The father of my children, um, he uh, unfortunately passed away at a very young age of a massive heart attack. Even though we were divorced, we, we still had a very good, uh, a very good friendship and, and respect for each other. It was a sad day when he passed away. I was a bus driver for disabled students um, that were all in wheelchairs. I love my job. I went to work every day with a smile on my face. It was my honor to work with those people. I got up at five, I took my shower, made my lunch, made my coffee, said goodbye to my cat Lucas, and out the door I went. I'm driving back to uh, Newton South High School and I'd gotten this, this sharp pain, and you know, I thought it was indigestion. I I'd, I'd had coffee that morning, and I have acid reflux disorder. And all of a sudden, I, I felt pain that went right up my left arm. And this was very painful, and I was like, uh-oh, and I'm thinking to myself, something's definitely wrong here. I'm in trouble. I'm having a heart attack but I need to get this bus in a, in a safe position. I called my boss and told her that I would not be finishing the day out. <laughs> and I'll never forget the, the sigh in her voice, like, <sighs> like, why? And I said, I'm having a heart attack. And she said, uh, that's not a good joke <laughs> for April Fool's Day. I said, it's not a joke, call 911.
When there's an emergency and 911 needs to be called, we're all paged. I don't think I've ever seen anybody in that much pain in my life. The pain, you could see the pain on her face. It was so intense. So we had her lay down, um, and then she started yelling that the pain was really bad. And we're like, Laura, we're right here, right, right here. And she just kept screaming and screaming. Last thing I remember was a female stating, um, we're cutting our clothes off. I'll cut my clothes off. I wasn't having a heart attack. I'm definitely having one now. And I looked down, and her eyes were wide open, and she wasn't moving. Everything that I'd ever learned about scuba diving was out the window. And time stopped. I no longer was thinking of any of the stuff that I'd learned from my, from my dive training or even that that was my buddy trying to help me. What's going through my head is basically survival. I, I'm gonna drown and I need to get out of here and get to the surface. I decide that it'd be better to die on the surface of the ocean than it was to die down here on the bottom. So I drop my weight belt and I go flying up like a, like a rocket from 90 feet. And as I start to go up, I feel a tremendous amount of pressure throughout my body. I saw Dave, uh, David pop out of the water like a cork. Very loudly was screaming, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. When you come up to the surface from a depth and you do it quickly, you have a buildup of nitrogen. And uh, these are very, very small bubbles. And they, uh, they grow. They get bigger and bigger. And uh, when you come up from depth uh, that quickly, they will go to parts of your body that are delicate, your, uh, your lungs in particular. And uh, tissue in your lungs will literally explode. Feels like I can't let the air out of my lungs fast enough, I feel like I'm going to pop. I hit the water very, very quickly. I noticed right when I got to him that there was some blood from his mouth, and it was frothy. I knew what that meant. It usually meant the bends, nitrogen, embolism. I grabbed him uh, by the back of his, his wetsuit collar and started dragging him to the boat, and he would repeat, um, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. I told him many, many times, uh, keep saying that, keep saying it loud. As long as you're saying that, you're alive. I can't breathe, and I can't see. It stops, everything stops. I realize I'm not in my body. As I open my eyes, I'm looking at, at this body floating in the water, and it's me. I see that my, my eyes seem swollen or bulging out of my head. I see that uh, I, I'm not breathing, and said, wow, I think I'm dead. And about that time is when I feel this energy or this pull behind me. I look and I see this light or this energy above me. I, I, I have fleeting glimpses of like, wow, I'm not in my body, and wow, maybe I need to, to, to try to get back to it. But the pull or the, the power of the energy that's behind me is so strong that I, that I really lose interest in, in my physical body very quickly. It 
was as though somebody had stuck a hose in my mouth and turned on water and I was drowning. I was in my ninth month. And I thought, oh, I'm having another baby. I must be in labor. My whole body had swollen up, and my, I had two huge incisions in my back, and they were pulling open. So the pain was excruciating. And I started calling, and then I started screaming. And people started rushing in. My blood pressure had fallen really low and they were screaming out my blood pressure. It was so chaotic and it was so intense. And that's when I started yelling, leave me alone, let me die, let me die. It was just, it was so frightening the way everybody was acting. It just really wasn't worth trying to struggle to survive. And it was, it was too much for me. I became overwhelmed and lost consciousness. thing I knew, I was out in the hallway. And I looked up and down the hall, and I didn't see anybody, but I thought, if they catch me out here, I'm going to get into trouble. So I turned around to move back into the room and saw the PA speaker at nose level. Now, I knew when I came into the hospital that PA speaker was mounted on the ceiling. And that's when I thought, something really strange is going on here. I moved back into the room, and I saw my body lying in the circle bed, but it didn't feel like it was me anymore. I was up at the ceiling, looking down, and I realized I felt calm. I probably had never felt that peaceful in my life. It was like all the stress was gone, but the next thing I knew, I was in total darkness. I believe that from the beginning of that experience, my body was dead because my soul wasn't in my body anymore. I'm in trouble. I'm having a heart attack. You could see the pain on her face. It was so intense. Her eyes were wide open, and she wasn't moving. It's like the whole world had melted away and it was just, I was so focused on her and so much adrenaline. The AED is an automated external defibrillator. There are pads, they go right on the victim and their little computers that sense if, they, if this person has a heartbeat or not. If it doesn't find a heart rate, it'll say, um, shock advised. I just remember looking down at a, this you know, blonde haired woman, very pale, eyes wide open. I gave her her first shock. And as soon as that shock went into her body, she sat up screaming. All of a sudden, the machine said, analyzing. I shocked her again. And the second time I shocked her, she um, kind of mumbled and groaned. The AED said, reanalyzing. Um, for the third time, it shocked her, um, and there was no response at all. She was gone. I 
I was alive one second and dead the next. And I remember floating straight up out of my body. And I looked down and I seen, I seen people and I seen myself, but I couldn't make out what they were doing. You feel really light and, and very much at peace. Like meditation, you know, you're, you're deep into this peace. I believe it's your soul because your body stays. I mean, I, I was looking over my body, so it is there. So what part of me went, you know? Um, my soul, my heart, that's when I realized I'm dead. I'm dead. I'm here. I'm dead. I was unconcerned with my dead body. I gave her two breaths and 30 compressions. Like, she's blue. I've never seen someone literally blue before. What truly convinced me was how can all these people be beating the living daylights out of me and I not feel nothing? Then these bright lights, like the ray of sun coming down, like a bolt of lightning, how, how light it is and how bright and powerful it is. And beautiful, vibrant, bright colors. It was like, it was like 4th of July. I believe I kept floating upwards and I kept on going. And did I wanna come back? No. and I see this light or this energy above me and said, wow, I think I'm dead. Once I got him on, onto the back of the boat, uh, the only thing I can do to help him with, with the vents is to get him on his side and elevate his feet. Theoretically, the nitrogen bubbles are gonna go uphill and uh, try to get those bubbles away from his brain. I went up to the bridge called the Coast Guard and put out a mayday. And I said that I had uh, a diver that had uh, popped out of the water. She keyed back and said, we have to analyze what the situation is to, for a proper response. I got back on the radio and got pretty stern and said, lady, if you don't get this man off the boat very, very quickly and launch a helicopter, it's gonna be your ass, not mine. A uh, lifeguard boat pulled up, assessed the situation, uh, noted that we had him in the correct position for what had happened. At that point, I really become focused on this energy and this light that's surrounding me. It's everything that I ever wanted to be because I never really felt like I wanted to be who I was. But I never felt such peace and love and comfort. As I embraced this life, it became me, and, and I became it. And uh, the energy proceeded to, to tell me, and, and not with words, with feelings, that my time wasn't done on Earth, that I had to go back, that, that I had a purpose. And I realized at that point that I wasn't going to get to stay. I was alive one second and dead the next. And did I want to come back? No. I 
don't believe at any point that, that I was here on Earth. I believe that it was, it was heaven. When you're there, you have no sense of, of Earth. It's like all your daily routine of things that you need to do. Like, you know, you need to go to the store, you need to do this, you need to do that. It doesn't, that doesn't go with you. To do CPR for nine minutes is a, is a very extended time. So it's exhausting. The ambulance arrived, and they just grabbed her from me. And I remember feeling like they were going in slow motion. They picked her up, they put her on. No one was doing any CPR still. I, I, I was like, I, I didn't know if I should run over and continue the CPR while she was on the stretcher. And I remember turning around and just hysterical, being just started crying, I think, and shaking. And then all of a the sudden, there's my ex-husband. He didn't look anything like what he looked when he died. Oh, he looked young. <laughs> I remember thinking to myself, wow, <laughs> you know? I had this feeling of, I'm happy to see you. Wow, this is, you know, it's exciting. He just looks so, so pure, so like, I don't want to use the word perfect, but, but very close to perfect, you know? my hand out for my ex-husband to, to take it, and he wouldn't. He, he did not take my hand, so it's like a feeling of rejection. You know, he's like, it's not your time. And then he, he floated away. The energy proceeded to, to tell me that my time wasn't done on Earth. Now, we were only four or five miles from their base. I heard the helicopter coming. Uh, I looked up and, and there it was, the helicopter was above us. I don't know why, I think I started to go back to the physical form and there was a, the pole started to come the opposite direction, pulling me back towards my body, pulling me back towards the, the boat. It felt like a suction, it felt like a... And, and I was back in my body, and the pain was un, unbelievable. It felt like every part of my body was being ripped apart. And as I, as I fought with whoever was working on me, I could hear myself screaming, no, I don't want to die, I don't want to die. And my spiritual form saying, I don't want to go. And, and I remember this conflict. And he was bleeding pretty good. Uh, and uh, from his mouth, said he couldn't move, uh, didn't move. The helicopter must have been over the top of the boat because I can remember the, the sound of this. They got me in a basket and then I'm going up. I get to the airplane and the paramedics working on me and I remember grabbing his hands and telling him no no I don't I don't want to do this I don't want to I don't want to go through this you know just let me go and uh, by the time we landed at the hospital I didn't want to fight anymore 
whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen and I'm not gonna be able to, do, to change it. And I received a phone call and the emergency room doctor said to me that they had David in the emergency room. And then I said, how is he doing? And they said, we don't know. That we don't have a lot of experiences with diving accidents and we don't know whether he's going to live or not. My body was dead because my soul wasn't in my body anymore. When I was out of my body and I could see it lying there, I knew I was dead. I knew I didn't want to go back to it. I was giving it up. So I moved into this darkness, and I felt this lush warmth wrap itself around me and pull me in, pull me into this. My grandmother had had a huge bosom, and when she had hugged me as a child, it was, it was like everything was okay, and my grandmother was pulling me into her. She was holding me, and she was comforting me like she used to when I was a little girl. We relived all 19 years of our life together. She had died when I was 19, but every single scene from every single thing happened again. There was one time when she let me cook with her. I couldn't have been more than three or four, and she pulled over this heavy wooden chair and put it next to the stove and stood me up on it. I can still feel her hands picking me up and putting me on this chair. And she went and she got her hairbrush and I had very, very curly hair. And she made Shirley Temple kind of curls, you know, long curls. And then she lifted me down and I remember running into the bedroom and looking in her mirror and feeling just like Shirley Temple. Was there to guide me so that I could understand something of love that I could relate to. And then I started moving away from her, but it was okay. It was like from her heart to my heart, she let me know that she'd always be there waiting for me when I came back. I would have loved to have stayed with her, but I was suddenly back in my body. And then I was back in my body, back in the circle bed, back in all that misery. I reached my hand out for my ex-husband to, to take it. And he wouldn't, you know, he's like, it's not your time. I was there. Minutes in time is not something that I felt throughout any of this process. And all of a sudden, this powerful, powerful, powerful energy came over me. And it was my son and my daughter and my granddaughter. It was flashes in my children's face. And 
it just, every second, just kept repeating their faces. My son, my daughter, my granddaughter, my son, my daughter, my granddaughter. And then before I knew it, I heard somebody say she's not going to make it. And uh, on the very third shock, <laughs> I decided that I was coming back. So I gave him a little bit of shock of his own. <laughs> I was flatlined for 57 minutes, and I was shocked. 21 times, I came back. She would say to the doctor, so she's going to be OK, she's going to be OK. And he would say, the mother that left to go to work that morning is not going to be the same mom that wakes up in this bed. I remember opening my eyes and consciously realizing that I was back in the circle bed, back in that room, back with all the monitors and bags and pain, and it was like, ugh, yuck. It was torture, and even if I had never had a near-death experience, six months in a body cast would have changed me a lot. You can't run away from yourself when you're in a body cast for six months. My view of the American dream is there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's a lot of fun. I mean, I enjoyed all the material things that we had, too, but, but it, we miss the point. It's so superficial. It's all about out there, when, in fact, what I learned was it's all about what's in here, that what we're really w supposed to be here working on is our inner life, is, lo is learning how to love ourselves, learning how to love everybody else. And that's what we get to take with us when we die, is the love that we've given away our whole life. And I have nine grandchildren now, and I know deep in my heart that I have the same, you know, relationship with them that I had with my grandmother. And I take care of one of my little grandchildren four days a week. She's 18 months old now, and, and she's the love of my life, and she looks at me just the way I looked at my grandmother. doctors were giving me very little hope, and it was very, very frightening. We don't know if he lives, if he'll be a vegetable or not. When I first saw Cheryl, uh, I put my arms around her, and we were both sobbing. The doctor said uh, um, it was a good thing that they did get, them in, get him into the hyperbaric chamber that quickly. Had it been any longer, he probably would not have made it. They had given me oxygen, trying to get the nitrogen bubbles out of my system. I remember my mom being there and people coming in and, and just looking at them being so angry, so angry inside that I didn't get to go. I was so upset that it was, I had to stay here. And I, and I remember thinking to myself, I don't want to be this guy. I don't want to be David Thomas. I want to be that spiritual form that I was in when I was in the light. I also had some, some depression going on. I had uh, 
this feeling of rejection from God or from this light or from the energy. He died and went to heaven, and, he, and, and God didn't want him, and he sent him back. And he felt unworthy. He felt God doesn't even love him. I think that I was going to be like that dude that just didn't get it. You know, I'm going to sit here and wallow in, the, in this, in this self-pity, or I'm going to have some serious pain to get encouraged to move on. You know, I just had a, a, a daughter, and, and uh, watching her birth come in here, it was just like that. It's like maybe the greatest gift is being right here right now. That near-death experience really taught me that life is all that, is great. He's going to be 40 years old in October, and, you know, that's not young for a new father, but he's incredible. He's, he's loving, and he's warm, and he's caring, and he's, um, he couldn't be happier, and neither could I. <laughs> and, and part of our gifts are to have fear and to walk through it. And on the other side of, of experiencing these things, we become whole with ourselves. And, uh, you know, I wake up every morning with a, with a newfound enthusiasm of, of living life. I was in a coma for three days. When I come out of my coma, I said it was it was a miracle. On my sixth day, I was up walking, and on my eighth day, I asked to go home. <laughs> It wasn't as if I could just get up and do everything, but I could function, you know? So on the ninth day, they did my discharge papers. So the miracle patient caught up and walked out, and nine days in the hospital and on my way home. When I met Michelle, it was her. I think we both had tears. I have a very close bond with Michelle, yes. I love Michelle for saving my life. That early CPR, that early defibrillation, that made all the difference. I'm sure it's changed her. I mean, it's changed me. I'll never be the same. Death experience has changed me in probably every aspect of my life. I cherish every moment that I had in heaven, but I also know that there is a place and purpose for me here. The important things in life for me are my children, first of all, and they've always been that way. Um, taking care of my health, but also just enjoying the moments at those moments. I've always had a sense of peace since this has happened to me. It continues to stay with me. Just go out and pass out the message and, and live in the moment. <laughs> <laughs>